go to uh, go to his name and go to more. And it should be like I was saying, like yeah. Uh, hit record and then maybe do it. <coughs> Is it recording? Yeah, hit record. Going there now. Uh, recording in progress. Sorry, now do. Lord just allowed me to screenshot. Okay. But you can do in the settings. It says it's recording here. Don't worry about recording, I'm recording it. Okay. Oh, there you go. Now I can screenshot. That's good. I don't need to be a host as long as I can screenshot. Is that okay? Yes. Is that showing up? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Aldo and asked me to give this talk, so I, this is somewhat short, but it's more just to kind of let you guys know about some of the differences in terms of both the nomenclature and also uh, kind of our channel feelings about these different medications that we use all the time. I didn't really go into a lot of detail on some of the studies, but we can talk about that if you like. And then mostly what I want is for you guys to ask questions so that uh, if you guys feel like there's a a knowledge gap somewhere in here in terms of what we're talking about. I, I want you guys to speak up and let me know about it so that we can, uh, we can hopefully address it. So, the title of this talk is Antiplatelet and Anticoagulation in Vascular Patients, but the bottom line is that I would rather fix bleeding than clotting. Uh, that's pretty much the, uh, the, the motto of the vascular surgeon is that I would rather have a little bit of bleeding afterwards that I have to address than have a patient bypass clot or endovascular treatment clot or a limb of their aneurysm, or a stroke after carotid surgery. And so that's one of the reasons why we do a lot of the medical uh, things that we do, is there's actually some pretty good data behind some of them. Um, so I'm going to very briefly uh, go over uh, common antiplatelet agents and anticoagulation, and then I'm going to go over it very briefly again, the rational therapy, and stopping and bridging some of these after, uh, before major and minor procedures. So the other thing is that the first rule of anticoagulation management is that most of us ignore the rules. So for instance, one of the things you may see us do all the time is put patients on uh, 500 units an hour of heparin after a lower extremity bypass. There's no data to support that, but that's what we want to do. Another thing is putting patients on anticoagulation after a prosthetic bypass. Uh, there's very limited data to support that, and it depends on kind of which way you want to look at it, but you'll find that a lot of people practice in a, in a way that they feel most comfortable, um, and it's very hard to get people to change that practice. I'll give a brief example. So we know that uh, during carotid endorectomy, if we have a patient on aspirin and Plavix, what we call dual antiplatelet therapy, those patients have a lower risk of a perioperative um, TIA stroke or death, all right? So they get through a, a surgery where the intended goal is to prevent a stroke, with a lower risk of that catastrophic outcome if we have them on aspirin or Plavix. However, you'll still find people that don't want to do those procedures on dual antiplatelet therapy because of perceived risk of bleeding. The risk of bleeding is higher, all right, on aspirin and Plavix than on uh, a single agent alone. However, the benefits outweigh the risk. One of the interesting things here is that we give a lot of heparin when we do these procedures and we often reverse it with protamine. There are some people similarly who feel very strongly about not reversing the medication, not reversing that heparin with protein for carotid procedures because again, they feel like that would prevent, or that would feel like that would induce a risk of stroke. We gave the protamine at the end of the carotid endorectomy. In fact, there's now multiple, multiple, multiple data series that show that giving protamine is actually very protective in carotid procedures. Still, people don't want to do it. So you're going to find out there that just, you know, some of the things we touch on, people don't necessarily do. So what's the difference between antiplatelet versus anticoagulant? This is something that we get a lot, um, you know, whether we're talking to a consulting service, sometimes when we're talking to you guys, we will hear or use uh, anticoagulant, antiplatelet, and hear them used interchangeably. It's important to differentiate between the two because when we say anticoagulant, we mean something that affects the clotting cascade, an antiplatelet. Antithrombotic just means something that prevents platelet aggregation, which then leads to coagulation, versus, versus an anticoagulant, which inhibits one or more steps within the clotting cascade. 
Aspirin and Plavix are antiplatelet agents. They are antithrombotic, but they are not anticoagulants. All right, so if somebody says, oh, that patient's anticoagulant, what are they on? They're on Aspirin and Plavix. They're not anticoagulants. They have antiplatelet medications on board. Warfarin, Goax, and Heparin are all anticoagulants. We'll talk about that. Let's talk briefly about antiplatelet agents. So, Aspirin, most common agent, most often given in either 81 milligrams or 325 milligrams, what we commonly refer to as either a baby dose, baby aspirin, or full dose aspirin. It irreversibly inhibits COX-1 and COX-2. It differentiates whether or not it inhibits the COX-1 or COX-2, um, depending on whether or not it's uh, 81 milligrams or full dose aspirin. And essentially what that will stop is, what, the, what that affects then is, it affects platelet aggregation, right? So if we have a plaque, in the carotid artery, in the coronary artery, and that plaque is unstable, and the cap of that plaque becomes exposed, platelets will want to adhere there, and that is then what will precipitate a TIA or a stroke or an MI. And having an aspirin or other antiplatelet agent on board will inhibit that platelet aggregation, prevents the platelets from sticking to, to each other. It has some other benefits that fall in line with that. It improves the dilation of the vessels, so it creates room around that plaque for blood to flow, and it prevents the proliferation of smooth muscle cells, which is what we call intimal hyperplasia. So if you have a stent or if you have a bypass, over time that stent or bypass may narrow because of intimal hyperplasia, which is essentially just deposition of smooth muscle cells. And so baby aspirin and other antiplatelet agents have those kind of three main benefits that we use uh, when we're doing procedures. If we need to stop an antiplatelet agent before surgery, generally you want to stop it aspirin seven days prior to surgery. The reason for that is because aspirin irreversibly binds these uh, enzymes, and it takes about 10 days to turn over your platelets within your bloodstream. So after about seven days, you have enough circulating platelets that are not bound to the aspirin to be able to you know, successfully uh, plot. What about clopidogrel, so Plavix? This is a irreversible P2Y12 inhibitor. So essentially this binds uh, this P2Y12 subunit and prevents the activation of platelets, which then allows for cross-linking um, of different platelets together. Again, it's anti-aggregation. It's often used in conjunction with aspirin, so this is when we talk about dual antiplatelet therapy, we're talking about aspirin and platelets, or aspirin and relenta, which is titegrelor. When indicated, you can stop it five days prior to surgery instead of seven days, and the reason is, is that it is irreversibly bound, but the half-life is slightly shorter, and so once it's out of your system, again, gets out of your system a little bit faster, especially if you're just on a maintenance dose, um, and then you know the, the platelets will kind of resume normal function. <laughs> oh. What about celastazole or pentoxifilin? So a lot of times we get a call from the pharmacy saying this, or you'll get an alert pop up for celastazole uh, or pentoxifilin, which are not really true. These are kind of more rheologic agents. These affect the smooth muscle function of the capillary bed, or the dispensability of platelets. They, in particular, pentoxifilin, you can hold the morning of surgery, but it, 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 it has a very short half-life, and it has no direct effect, really, on platelet inhibition. So you can have somebody be on pentoxifilin, although usually people aren't on that head often anymore. So last is all, similarly, um, you can stop it if you want. Oftentimes, it's not a true platelet inhibitor. Unless somebody has that in their record that they're taking celastazole because of a prior bad reaction to aspirin, let's say, and so they're taking celastazole and clopidogrel as a modified version of dual antiplatelet therapy, it is not generally regarded as a significant elevator of bleeding risk, certainly within vascular procedures. So why do we, why do we, you may see some patients that are taking especially our T-card patients that are taking Tichegrelor, Berlinta, versus standard Clopidogrel, Plavix. And those two medications are both those P2Y12 inhibitors, all right? So you should think of them as very similar medications. There are slight differences between them. 
why do we have a patient on Ticagrelor versus Clopidogrel? And this is really important. If you look at Clopidogrel, it's a nice once a day medication. 75 milligrams once a day will load the patients with either 150, 300. Some people will load the patients with 600 milligrams of, of Clopidogrel. And the reason why we load patients with the medication is because a lot of patients, up to 35% of patients who are taking Clopidogrel don't see the intended therapeutic effect of the clopidogrel. The reason for that is that the clopidogrel relies on the P450 metabolism system within your liver to activate the drug, all right? So when you take clopidogrel, when you take platelets, certain patients are not gonna have the active metabolite in their bloodstream at a high enough level to have the intended effect. Five to 10% of patients are completely resistant. They will have no effect on clopidogrel, all right? and an additional 25% are only partially responsive. We don't have, actually throughout our system, we don't have a very accurate way to test for this. There is a point of care test called the Verify Now test that we don't have here at this hospital, and up in Hartford, the only place that we have it is in the cath lab. And so if you wanna run a specimen to see whether or not a patient is clopidogrel sensitive or not, you essentially have to have the patient on the table to be able to do that. A lot of times with our transparotic stents, we do those as an elective procedure. If we were to bring the patient in for that procedure, bring them into the hybrid OR, bring them into IR downstairs, run that assay, find out they're not sensitive to clopidogrel, we would have to you know, wake them up, cancel their test, bring them back out, put them on a different medication, schedule them for a different day. The reason is, is that dual antiplatelet therapy is particularly effective for preventing stent thrombosis. We know that in the coronary literature. We translate that into the carotid stenting literature. And so it's really imperative that our patients are on this dual antiplatelet therapy before they go through these procedures. What we have chosen to do is put patients on Ticagrelor on Berlinta instead of Clopidogrel because Ticagrelor has a much higher bioavailability. All right, the likelihood that a patient is going to be resistant to ticagrelor is much lower, you know, on the, a couple percentage points as opposed to up to 35% of patients uh, who are on aspirin and clopidogrel. One of the things that's important to know about Relenta is that it's twice a day dosing, all right? So you want to make sure if you're talking to a patient and giving patient instructions about ticagrelor and Relenta, that you're telling them that you take it once in the morning, once in the evening. There's two doses, 60 and 90 milligrams. We usually use the 90 milligram dose, BID, all right? If we want to load a patient on Valenta, we give them just two pills, 180 milligrams. And obviously we would go over these things with you guys at the time we're going to try to so. What about anticoagulation medication? So just very briefly to touch on the common anticoagulants that are used. So warfarin, as you guys know, or Coumadin is a vitamin K antagonist. So it blocks the uh, activity of vitamin K and therefore affects uh, the, the formation of vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Doax are direct oral anticoagulants, right? These are direct either thrombin or factor 10A inhibitors. Perdaxa, which is the bigotran, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Apixaban and rivaroxaban, which are Eliquis and Zerolto respectively, are direct factor 10A inhibitors. How do you know if they're 10A inhibitors? Because they have an XA in the generic name, right? So Apixaban, Rivaroxaban, and Sorelto here has it too, 10A, right, Sorelto. What about the IV options? So heparin is a reversible anti-thrombin three binder that prevents the uh, activation of thrombin um, by binding on the factor 10A and the factor 10A kind of uh, anti-thrombin three will bind Will, uh, will inhibit the activation of the clot. Doxaparin, which is Lovenox, is a smaller subunit that binds AP3. It can only block the activation of 10A. It doesn't also block the activation of Um uh, Whereas heparin will block will block both. It'll it'll act, it'll bind it'll prevent the activation of 10A and it'll prevent the direct activation of Our Argatraban and bivalrutin are direct thrombin inhibitors, so similar to the DOAX, except for their IV formation. And we use these ergatroban in particular in patients who have a history of uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So what's our rationale for therapy? So for antiplatelet medication, our rationale for therapy, again, is that it prevents platelet aggregation. 
This is important in unstable coronary, parotid, and lower extremity patients. It's imperative that our patients are on some type of antiplatelet therapy prior to many, if not pretty much all vascular procedures. I don't think there's a case that we will do when we don't want the patients on at least a baby aspirin. And that's both to prevent coronary events, but for instance, in the lower extremities, if we're gonna go and do an angiogram on somebody and stent them, uh, we wanna make sure that they're on antiplatelet therapy ahead of time, because if not, there's a higher incidence of uh, thrombotic events, especially like sometimes in, in response to a stent or to balloon angioplasty. If you think about it, if we have a plaque and we're angioplasting it, we're exposing some of the core of that plaque. And if we don't have an antiplatelet agent on board, the heparin is helpful, but the platelets are still functioning, all right? So we've inhibited the clotting cascade with the heparin, but we haven't necessarily inhibited the platelet aggregation. We know from a lot of retrospective series that patients who are on an aspirin and have a high risk of cardiac events, either recent cardiac events, recent cabbage, they have a high rate of in-hospital cardiac events and cardiovascular related mortality if they're not on an aspirin surrounding these major vascular cardiac procedures. So who should remain on antiplatelet therapy? Any patient undergoing a cabbage, patients who are having vascular surgery, patients with a recent percutaneous coronary intervention or with recent acute coronary syndrome, patients with high-risk cardiac features who are undergoing non-cardiac uh, non surgery. Do so all patients need antiplatelet therapy? This was examined. So essentially there was a prospective randomized trial of over 10,000 patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery, stuff like apis, colis, herniae, they were at risk for vascular complications, so they had some risk factors associated with some of the things that are on the left side, and they were given either aspirin versus placebo around the time of surgery. Obviously, patients that had recent coronary events, recent cabbage, all these things, they were excluded from the trial. Essentially, it was just patients with risk factors, kind of this bottom category here. They found that, in general, there was no effect on perioperative MI or death, but it did increase the risk of major bleeding. So when I'm telling you that I really want a patient to be on an aspirin before my procedure, it doesn't really matter if the patient gets an aspirin or not, you know, before their, their gallbladder. That being said, if I just put a stent in on somebody and they're gonna stop their aspirin for taking their gallbladder out, I'd like to get that. But, you know, that's kind of falls more into some of these top categories than some of the lower ones. That, Dave Pilati, that that's a very interesting point. Um, so if you just put a stent in somebody, what's the time frame that they absolutely should be on their antiplatelet for, for general surgery, not to screw it up? Uh, how I mean, I think it depends on where the stent is, for one. Um, you know, for instance, patients that have an EVAR, an aneurysm repair, we put them on a baby aspirin because we know that that decreases their risk of further thrombotic events, uh, the risk of limb occlusion uh, of, their, of their EVAR limbs. However, those are large limbs in a high flow area. A lot of those patients can easily stop all antiplatelet therapy if needed um, and then restart afterwards. If we put a stent in somebody's leg for chronic limb threatening ischemia, um, we may not want to stop an antiplatelet. We may want to keep at least a baby aspirin on, but we would stop the dual antiplatelet therapy, let's say, after 30 days. Um, a lot of that data is has not been studied prospectively, usually just retrospective or based on clinical trials. So what I would say is that if you've got a patient who needs time-sensitive non-vascular surgery and they're on dual antiplatelet therapy, just discuss it with the vascular surgeon or interventionalist to perform the procedure. Um, you know, if we have a patient that has like a transparotid stent, for instance, those patients absolutely have to be on dual antiplatelet therapy for 30 days. We can't interrupt. 30 days. So, yeah. So generally speaking, I'd say 30 days at least, but again, it's always best to just have a discussion. So anticoagulation. Patients are taking anticoagulation preoperatively for a number of factors, whether it's atrial fibrillation, prior recent DDT or PE, mechanical aortic or mitral valve, in which case really the only, the only indicated anticoagulation therapy for mechanical valves is warfarin, or other, other history of clotting disorders or thromboembolic events. Anticoagulation. Can they stop their anticoagulation prior to surgery? Well, if they have a mechanical valve, they likely need some kind of bridging. And it depends uh, certainly on where that mechanical valve is. 
Patients with a mitral valve absolutely need to be bridged. Patients with an aortic valve should probably also be bridged, although it is not as critical. Patients with a mitral valve really shouldn't sit with a subtherapeutic uh, INR or a uh, subtherapeutic anjac 10 a because the risk of clotting events is quite high. Um, recent DVT or PE. So if they have a recent DVT or PE that's less than three months um, and they have a time-sensitive procedure, then they may need to have something like a temporary filter placed prior to their procedure to prevent the risk of uh, clotting events uh, surrounding surgery, or they need to be bridged onto heparin and then bridged back off of heparin afterwards. There's recent guidelines to suggest that depending on the severity of the DDT, and certainly if they haven't had a PE, they may just be able to be bridged on the heparin or lobinox, undergo their procedure, and then be placed back on anticoagulation as opposed to have a temporary filter placed. Um, what about atrial fibrillation? It depends on their estimated event risk. So that's what we have, that's what we have the chance to score. We can kind of calculate whether or not we think patients have a high risk of clotting events. In general, especially with the DOACs, we feel very comfortable stopping these medications prior to surgery because they're only off for 48 hours and then we can resume afterwards. Um, the event rate will vary with the duration of therapy interruption. However, just so everyone's aware, it's not zero. So for instance, uh, the event rate in some of the clinical trials that studied the efficacy of um, Zorelto and Eliquis, the event rate was around 0.3-0.4% of patients who had interruption of the therapy for surgery during the clinical trial had an event rate while their um, had an event while their therapy was interrupted. So it's just something to discuss. You know, again, what's the indication for surgery? Most of the time, we'll just stop uh, the DOAX 48 hours before, which makes life easy. You know, before with Coumadin, we used to have bridge patients with Lovenox. We don't have to do that so much. So what about interruption of anticoagulation? So when to stop warfarin, we can hold it. Uh, we have that recent patient who was getting vitamin K. Uh, if we're bridging, we usually recommend initiating bridging therapy in an IR of less than two. Uh, personally, I prefer heparin to Lovenox because I think that there's less opportunity for confusion. Um, it's rapid on and off and it avoids aberrant dosing if we're working with the hospital team, the hospital team and the patient's being bridged on and they get a full dose of uh, the box the morning of the procedure, then we have to potentially um, reschedule the procedure versus heparin. You know, we can always reverse it if needed. Um, what if reversal is needed if we work? If it's semi elective, like over 24 hours, we recommend getting oral or IV vitamin K. Oftentimes we'll get pushback there because um, once you give vitamin K, it takes a long time for the patient to build up uh, their, their INR again to a therapeutic level. And if the patient is renal impaired, again, like this inpatient we currently have, um, they can't be bridged on low enough, so they end up sitting in the hospital uh, on warfarin again as they're waiting for the therapeutic. Some of the time that can depend on their indication. Um, so, for instance, if a patient has a remote history of a DVT or something, uh, or even sometimes with atrial fibrillation, you can send them out of the hospital without bridging, especially if their INR is starting to kind of creep up the final therapy. Um, if the procedure is time sensitive, hours, you can give IDFFP, and if it's emergent, like we have to go to the OR right now, you can give uh, proton and complex concentrate, like but then you should also remember to give vitamin K. Half-life of K-Centra is quite short, and when it wears off, the patients might have um, still, you know, they, they, they might have inactivation again, especially if they have certain relating levels of their anticoagulation medication on board, uh, which then uh, which then puts them at risk of vitamin K in addition to the K-Centra. Um, what about the DOAC? So for low to moderate bleeding risk, uh, up-to-date guidelines are basically to say to omit this medication one day before surgery. Most people that we interact with, including ourselves from most vascular surgeries, will want this medication to be off for two days. But for things like angiograms and low to moderate risk patients, we can just hold the anticoagulation for one day and then resume one day after. Um, for high bleeding risk patients, we'll usually omit for two days, which they, uh, at that point, it's completely safe procedure. So if we the patients holding their go at like three, four days, that's, they don't need to hold it for that long, two to 40 hours. Um, the only exception to that is in renal insufficiency patients with Pradaxa, because Pradaxa is uh, uh, renally metabolized. And so in that case, uh, sometimes patients will have to be offered a uh, um, for certain very low risk procedures like IDC filter retrieval, and for some cases of venography or venous stenting, we may not interrupt the patient's anticoagulation. In those cases, the risk of bleeding is quite low, 
And for instance, if we're taking out somebody's IVC filter and they've had a DVT within the last three months, we don't want them to be at risk of a current DVT. Risk of bleeding with IVC filter retrieval is essentially zero, and we'll just keep them on the main type vibration application um, rather than interrupting on the risk of a current DVT. I think that's it. Uh, I think how it works out. Do you guys have any questions about these? Yes, Dr. Gifford. <laughs> Quite routinely, we place patients on aspirin and Plavix, but you said that some people, up to 25%, don't respond to Plavix. And the only way to really test it is at Hartford, at, you know, at bedside and the cath lab. So how do we know these patients that we are doing these procedures on, such as TCARs, are not walking around subtherapeutic? So, that's a great question. And the answer is, is that for, there's a couple different ways we can approach it. So, for instance, for Plavix, for clopidogrel, most of the non-response is this partially responsive group. We can overcome that by just giving more Plavix, all right? So for instance, there are studies where we, where patients get, you know, 600 milligrams uh, loading and then they get 150 milligrams once a day. Unfortunately, to your main question, we don't have the ability to test for that, all right? Um, there is a test that we do down in the ED here I'm blanking on the name, we've gotten it done before, but I've looked at it in detail, I've looked at it in detail, it is not a sensitive test for assessing Plavix function. Verify now is really the gold standard test for, for, uh, for whether or not somebody is sensitive to Plavix, and like I said, it's a point of care test. So even within, you know, even centrally in Hartford, we have no ability to test for that preoperatively because it requires a prep specimen and some Quest labs, they, they won't, uh, they, they won't, run it on site for patients. Um, the way that we have chosen in patients where we absolutely have to make sure that the dual antiplatelet therapy is working as intended is to just put patients on Valenta, on Tycheco. That's what we do for most of our TCAR patients. There was a recent TCAR patient who uh, was allergic to Valenta. You can get some shortness of breath, so I kind of like some wheezing on Valenta sometimes, and he had had that reaction. And so in, in that case, we did the best we could, and we kind of looked at a, um, a, a platelet function assay, like a kind of a tag, and it seemed like his platelets were inhibited. And so we went forward with aspirin and Plavix, and he did fine. And I will say that anecdotally, although the Plavix non-response rate is very high, we don't see a clinical downside to that. So if you look at patients who are treated uh, with TCARs, most of the patients are just on aspirin and Plavix without an obvious higher risk of stroke. My personal feeling is, is that if I have a post-operative stroke with a TCAR, you know, that is like, it should be a, a less than 1% event. And so anything that I can do to prevent it, I'm gonna do. And if that means I put patients on Valenta for the first 30 days, then I'll do that. Um, the downside to Valenta, again, is the twice a day dosing as opposed to once a day. And it's more expensive because well, it's not generic. So oftentimes patients are buying the brand name depending on what their copay is. Um, and you can talk to patients about that ahead of time. But the bottom line is, is for things like TCAR, we, we really stress the importance of the aspirin and polenta. For other procedures like lower extremity angioplasty stenting, um, the role of the dual antiplatelet therapy has a lot more to do with long-term reduction in the smooth muscle cell deposition and intimal hyperplasia. And so therefore, we're not as caught up on the uh, immediate response, and we'll usually be happy with just aspirin and Plavix. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Other questions? I think the biggest thing to take home is just that patients who are on aspirin, Plavix, Berlintivit, Clopidogrel, Ticagrelor, these are not patients that are anticoagulating. And oftentimes we will continue to surgery with patients on these medications. And in fact, it's really important that for some of these patients, they're on some type of anti therapy uh, at baseline. Now, another question is, Dr. Gifford, is from time to time I've seen these patients on dual antiplatelet therapy, and then they also mm -hmm. add Lovenox. Isn't, doesn't that put them at even higher risk for bleeding? And, and should we continue to do that, or should we just not put them on Lovenox after a procedure? If they're already on dual antiplatelet? Yeah, that's a good question. So I personally feel like the Lovenox, so you're talking about prophylactic. Correct, prophylactic, not therapeutic. Yeah, 
so, so my personal feeling about it is that, um, you know, obviously there are patients after vascular procedures that get VTs. It is somewhat uncommon, thankfully. Uh, I think in part because we're giving patients a lot of heparin at the time of their procedure. Um, but usually what I'll recommend is, you know, like let's say in a CEA patient, I might wait a full 12 to 18 hours before giving that patient some type of subcutaneous prophylaxis. And in vascular patients, generally, we would kind of prefer TIV heparin dosing as opposed to the low dose, especially once a day low dosing, because again, I, I'm not sure what the data is to support this or not, but I think anecdotally we all feel a little more comfortable with that. Got it. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Right, who's thank the, you, who's sir. doing the bypass? I am. Don't all the hands go up at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex. All right. Sounds good. All right. He's all. Oh, no, the bypass. No, no, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. What is it? Oh, I'm doing that. Yeah